Good morning. Uh, I'm Patty Cleary, uh, and I go. I use she, her pronouns, uh, and I am on the board. I'm a liaison to something that I've forgotten the name of. Anyway, <laughs> and it has a name, but whatever. So, welcome to the Universalist Unitarian Universalist con Congregation. We are a religious community who commit ourselves to diversity. We hope to nourish human differences, those of gender, race, age, ability, sexual orientation, political views, culture, class, and religious belief. Uh, welcome to all who treasure freedom of conscience in the search for truth. We, welcome, uh, we promise to do our best to provide you a spiritual home. We extend a special welcome to our visitors today. We hope that you follow our Facebook page to participate in Zoom and to receive announcements about special events and our religious exploration classes, please sign up for our weekly email. There should be a link in the comments section of our Facebook page where you can sign up. And after today, we will only be streaming via Zoom. So if you're streaming via Facebook, um, now's the time to move over just to get the email with the Zoom link. Um, I'd like to draw atten your attention to our recent announcements. For those in person, they are printed in your order of service. There are links in the UUC newsletter and weekly UUC connections for those watching online today. Okay, so I have some special announcements, basket announcements next. Um, from the Social Responsibility Committee, we still have opportunities uh, for you to volunteer at the Sojourner House Homeless Shelter this Friday evening. It is a safe experience for adults to assist people as they register, store their belongings, and serve supper. You can sign up on the UUC website or in the UUC connections that comes by email tomorrow. Contact Ken Adler if you have questions. Thank you. There's another one. Um, from Julia and the music committee, after the closing words of the service, there will be a music for going forth. As the title suggests, this is music for going to coffee and or conversation, not for listening. Close your ears. Um, Sue Beetle Sism will be singing music for giving instead of Danny Higley. There's another announcement. Uh, <clears throat> Those interested in learning about UUC next Saturday, will there will be a new to UU class at 9.30 a.m. You can sign up um, at one of the great, uh, greeting tables at the back or talk to Reverend Julie after the service for more. Now, <laughs> I have an announcement uh, from the Harvest Auction Committee. I was wondering if it would take like a, a costume change, but no, it's just a little spin. Um, so, what does the Harvest Auction have in common with the Sundance Film Festival this year? It's in person! It's in person! Woo! So, we will also have um, an online or an option, and it will be here at the church. Um, so, you can get a Zoom link, it's like one Zoom link per ticket, or people can arrive per ticket. Um, we have live performances from Ken Adler and Laura Getz. We're going to have appetizers, desserts, and the live auction will be here. The silent auction will still be um, uh, on our Octria site. So what can you do? Buy some tickets. That'll help us scale up and understand the total amount of people that will be here. Um, that we're going to scale up because we're buying the appetizers this year. Sign up to bring a, a beverage or uh, a dessert, become a sponsor, get ready to bid on the silent auction, get your fingies ready for that, um, and volunteer for, to help out. We've got, we're going to have one of those um, monitor stations in the basement, so if you want to watch the live auction but help out in the kitchen, you will have the ability to still check out on what's going on. So uh, we're really looking forward to it this year. Uh, me and possibly John will be in the back. Yes, you'll be in the back. We'll be in the back here to answer any questions. We, you can sign up for a ticket here. Just give us cash or check and we'll sign you up for a ticket. We'll need an email address um, or you can buy all your tickets online. So ask us questions and help us make this a memorable event. Thank you. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Amy Johnson, RE coordinator, and I have one more announcement. There is a Halloween party happening downstairs in the social hall right after service, so if you go downstairs, there's going to be a party. <laughs> Her dance party and I might have to stick around for that. Uh, <laughs> so I have our music for gathering today and it's one that many of you may know. It's uh, Ancient Mother. It is in our hymnal uh, but I'll just be sharing that with everyone to contemplate and get into the thoughts of the season. Ancient Mother, I hear you calling. Ancient Mother, I hear your song. Ancient Mother, I feel your laughter. Ancient Mother, I taste your tears. Our opening words this morning are from Meg Barnhouse, and I'm the Reverend Julianne Lepp, and as you see, we are all dressed for Halloween today, and so excited to be here with you. Uh, Meg Barnhouse says, I want this to be a lesson to sink deep into me. Celebrate being alive, drawing breath, that you are achingly sad today, and it will pass. It is good to be able to feel feelings. Celebrate that there is a love so big and so good that it can hurt to lose it. That there was a time so sweet that you ache remembering it. Honoring the ache in your heart or the tears falling. Life is mostly ordinary time. Ordinary time shot through with light, pain, and with love. So I realized I didn't introduce myself, I just started singing. Uh, so my name is Amanda Lonsdorf, and I'm your, your worship associate today. And today we gather um, together in the name of uh, All Souls and Samhain and Halloween and our Fall and Leaves service. And these recognize that these are no ordinary days. Today we contemplate the lessons of leaves and letting go. Every year, these traditions put us in touch with our own mortality, with the changing of the seasons, and the passage of time. They remind us of the precious gift that each breath gives us, and brings gratitude to all those who came before. Come, let us worship together. Good morning. My name is Louise Schutz. Please join me in reading the words in the bulletin as we light the chalice today. We light this chalice which transforms wax into pure light and warmth to remind us of our own living, transforming the stuff of this world into the love and activity of our daily lives. As we remember all those we name today, may today bring forth transformation in ourselves. From grief, healing, from memory, wholeness, and from celebration, love. Hello, my name is Kate Van Sloten, and I have a reading for you all by David M. Horst called The Last Leaf. Once, many gray autumns ago, I came upon a tree. The tree, a poplar, had dropped all of its leaves but for one, just one. Exactly one leaf remained near the topmost part of the tree, 
fluttering in the breeze like a little reddish brown flag. All of the other leaves lay about the ground or had blown away. I stopped and looked and marveled at the sight. I wondered what the odds might be that I, I was the one person who happened to arrive at that one tree at that one moment when that one leaf remained. What were the odds? I felt an instant kinship with the one leaf. I admired its stubbornness. I spoke quietly to it saying, hang on, never give up, don't let go. I gazed at that last leaf for a time, though I did not stay to witness its falling. I did not want to witness its falling. The leaf was not ready to let go and drop silently to the ground, and neither was I. Though I knew we both would, in time, let go. I praised the last leaf on that autumn day many years ago when I was still young. I walked on and slowly, imperceptibly, a sense of calm came over me, a sense of acceptance, a sense of peace. The exuberance of summer is gone. Grand plans and high hopes, they're giving way to a chilly reality. We loved the best we could. We've reaped as much as we could. We've traveled life's journey as far as we could. We count our blessings and our losses. All leaves must fall. The circle of the year comes round. Our hemisphere tilts away from the sun. Green turns to gold. Life returns to the soil. Animals retreat. The nights, they grow long. The natural world lies fallow. The season of letting go comes as it always comes. Winter begins. Hey, if you would all, I, I'm Sue Beetle Sism. <laughs> Um, and if you would all turn to 1051 in your teal hymnals, we are going to be singing We Are. There are a bunch of repeats in this song. so <laughs> And if you'll please rise in body or spirit. Oh gosh, if you would please rise in body or spirit to join us in singing We Are. <laughs> of courage. 
We are daughters of dust and the sons of great visions. We're sisters of mercy and brothers of love. We are lovers of life and the builders of nations. We're seekers of truth and keepers of faith. We are makers of peace and the wisdom of ages. We are our grandmother's prayers and we are our grandfather's dreamings. We are the breath of our ancestors. We Each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who, who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who, who we are. Lovely, everybody. And now I invite our tree and our leaves to come forward. We have a very, very special presentation of Fiona the Last Leaf. And you might be familiar if you've been here a long time with Freddie the Leaf. Well, this is Fiona the Last Leaf, special to Carson Park. So if you know Carson Park and Lakeshore and all of that, you are in for a treat. Spring had passed, and so had summer. In Carson Park, Fiona, the leaf, had grown large. Fiona, who are you? I think Amy is Fiona. She had grown large. Yes, I'm large. <laughs> her midsection was wide and strong, and her five extensions were firm and pointed. She had first appeared in spring as a small sprout, on a rather large branch at the top of a tall tree. Fiona was surrounded by hundreds of other leaves just like herself, or so it seemed. Soon she discovered that no two leaves were alike, even though they were on the same tree. Alfred was the leaf next to her, and that is Leo here. And Ben was the leaf on her right, and Claire was the lovely leaf overhead. And they had all grown up together. They had learned to dance in the spring breeze, bask lazily in the summer sun, and wash off in the cooling rains. They loved to see the boaters on Half Moon Lake and hear the laughter of the children at the playground at Birch Pavilion. But it was Danielle, who was Adrian over here, who was Fiona's very best friend. She was the largest leaf and seemed to have been there before anyone else. It appeared to Fiona that Danielle was also the very wisest among them. Did you know that we are part of a tree? We are growing in a public park. Did you know that the trees with the strongest roots have them hidden underground? Danielle explained about the birds who came to sit on their branches and sing morning songs. She explained about the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the seasons. I love being a leaf. I love my branch and my light leafy friends and my place high in the sky. I love the wind that jostles me about, the sun rays that warm me, the moon that covers me with soft white shadows. Summer had especially been nice. The long, hot days felt good, and the warm nights were peaceful and dreamy. There were many people in the park that summer that often came and sat under Fiona's tree. Giving shade is part of my purpose. What's a purpose? A reason for being, to make things more pleasant for others, is a reason for being. To make shade for old people who come to escape the heat of their homes is a reason for being, to provide a cool place for the children to come and play, to fan with our leaves 
the picnickers who come to eat on checkered tablecloths. These are reasons for being. I especially like the old people. They sit so quietly on the cool grass and hardly move. They talk in whispers of times past. Fiona thought that the children were fun too, even though they sometimes tore holes in her bark or carved their names into it. She loved it when the kids from Lakeshore came to fish and playgroups came to play. It was fun to watch them move so fast and laugh so much. But Fiona's summer passed. It vanished on an October night. She had never felt so cold. Leaves, can you show us how you feel cold? All the leaves shivered with the cold. They were coated in a thin layer of white, which quickly melted, left them dew drenched and sparkling in the morning sun. We have experienced our first frost. It is the sign that it was fall and winter will be coming soon. Almost at once, the whole tree, in fact, the whole park, was transformed into a blaze of color. There was hardly a green leaf left. My name's Alfred, and I'm the deepest yellow a leaf can be. <laughs> My name is Ben, and I'm, I have a bright orange. Yep. My name is Claire, and I have become a blazing red. I'm Sarah, and just look at the gold color I've become. I am a deep purple. <laughs> <laughs> I am red, gold, and blue. How beautiful they all looked. Fiona and her lovely friends had made their tree a rainbow. Why did we turn different colors when we were on the same tree? Well, each of us is different. We have had different experiences. We have faced the sun differently. We have cast shade differently. Why should we not have different colors? This is the season of fall. One day, a very strange thing happened. The same breezes that in past had made them dance. Can the leaves dance? They began to push and pull at the stems, and they caused the leaves to be torn from their branches and swept up in the wind, and all the leaves became frightened. What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? It's what happens in the fall. It's the time for leaves to change their home. So people call it to die. Will we all die? Yes, everything dies, no matter how big or small, how weak or strong. We first did our job. We experience, we experience the sun and the moon, the wind and the rain. We learn to dance and to laugh. Then we die. I won't die. Will you, Danielle? Yes, when it's my time. When is that? No one knows for sure. Look at those other leaves falling. It must be their time. Fiona saw that some of the leaves lashed back at the wind. Before the others fell, others simply let go and dropped quietly. Soon the tree was almost bare. I'm afraid to die. I don't know what's down there. We all fear what we don't know, Fiona. It's natural. Yet you were not afraid when spring became summer. You were not afraid when summer became fall. They were natural changes. Why should you be afraid of the season of death? Does the tree die too? Someday, but there, there is something stronger than that tree. It is life. That lasts forever, and we are all part of life. Where will we go when we die? No one knows for sure. That's the great mystery. Will we return in spring? We may not, but life will. Then what has been the reason for all of this? Why were we here at all if, only, if we only have to fall and die? It has been about the sun and the moon. It's been about happy times together. It's been about the shade and the old people and the children. It's been about the shade. It's been about colors in the fall. It's been about seasons. Isn't that enough? 
That afternoon, in the golden light of dusk, Danielle let go. She fell effortlessly. She seemed to smile peacefully as she fell. Goodbye for now, Fiona. Then Fiona was alone, the only leaf left on her branch. The first snow had fell that following morning. It was soft, white, and gentle, but it was bitter cold. There was hardly any sun that day, and the day was very short. Fiona found herself losing color, becoming brittle. It was constantly cold, and the snow weighed heavily upon her. At dawn, the wind came that took Fiona from her branch. It didn't hurt at all. She felt herself float gently and softly downward. And as she saw the whole tree for the first time, how strong and firm it was, she was sure that it would live for a long time. And she knew that she had become a part of its life and it made her proud. Fiona landed on a clump of snow. It felt soft and even warm. In this new position, she was comfortable, more comfortable than she had ever been. She closed her eyes and fell asleep. She did not know that spring would follow winter and that the snow would melt into water. She did not know what appeared to be her useless dried self would join the water and serve to make the tree stronger. Most of all, she did not know there asleep in the tree and the ground were already plans for new leaves in the spring. And now the next act is called the beginning. And the tree sprouts green leaves. The end. Well, thank you to everyone that helped us with our play today. And now is the time for giving. So after the giving, we will uh, be calling the names of those who have passed, uh, who you wish to especially remember. So we ask that you write clearly as uh, possible uh, one name on the leaf that you've received along with your order of service. Is there anyone that doesn't have a leaf that wants one? Raise your hand. Okay, if you do need, need a leaf or writing utensil, we have a wonderful uh, Bob in the back willing to hand out. Oh, was there a hand? Oh, need a writing utensil, all right. <laughs> so if you wish, you can add a word or two to describe uh, the legacy or a gift that this person uh, has brought you. Um, humans and furry uh, creatures are well welcome. Uh, for some of us, uh, this may be difficult to remember, but that's okay. And for others, perhaps children, again, there may be um, no one or other pets that you want to uh, remember. Again, pet's name is just fine. We will now have time of silence before the giving while you think about whom to honor in our remembering and write that name on the leaf. Again, there are pencils in the pews, or if there aren't any writing utensils, just raise your hand.
Hearts will be lighter, nights be brighter under the harvest moon. Thank you for that beautiful music. And I did wanted to uh, make sure to let folks know that this month's 50-50 recipient is the Roundtable Revival. Uh, so those that are in person, of course, can give um, money or uh, check or pay online. But also, I wanted to let our guests online know that uh, you can type into the chat and uh, if you'd like uh, any to, sorry, for those online, you can type into the chat and you'd be able to, uh, you'd like to be read aloud it wrong. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so uh, you can also uh, donate online to the uh, UU from there. And now we'll begin our uh, reading of the names in just a moment. I want to do our congregational response from giving. So if you'll all join me in the words, from you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. Can I invite some kids up to help hang the leaves? <laughs> so just want to check any other leaves that we have not we missed. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll start reading the names. Cass and Rose Jankowski. Frida Shaw and Charlie Ryan. Lambert. Maria and Vernon Beadle. Carol Johnson, giving. Blackberry, the cat of Rainbow Chicks Farm. Mom and Dad. Sid, the llama of Dream Valley Farm. Blackberry, Rai Rai, Fildy, Sid, Grandad, Uncle Bob, Rosie, Riley, Big Sneezy, Pippin, and Monchette. Sydney, Ankle Biter Extraordinaire. Art and Ruth. Jean Carpenter. My cat, um, Callie and Izzy. Millie and John. Miss you, Grandma and Grandpa. Elsa. Andrew Hudson, who always listened. Houston. Houston, sorry. Um, Aggie. 
Laurel. Thich Nhat Hanh, voice from peace and truth. Mom, I wish you were here taking your advice. Our guinea pigs, Fluffy and Rose Tyler. Rick St. Germain. Lucille, Granny Lou Christensen. Christensen. Grandma and a heart. Calhoun. Mom, light. Rick, my dad. Ty. Pappy made the best mango smoothies. Lucy, a very good dog. Glenn, love, companionship, security, and humor. Gran Mary. Lucy, Brody, Frankie, our Visla babies. Serenia Schroeder, Brent, Brent Schroeder. And I think this says uh, Stroker or Stoker, a very um, loyal, very shy, and very dirty cat. Or maybe Stinker. Stinker, that's what it says. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Kathy F. Sorry, Kathy F. Uh, oh, Verhagen. Fine friend. Stinker and Asha. Chet and Spot. Jerry Suki. Jim Lavin and Joe Strubin. Wonderful gentlemen. Mom and Dad. Elliot Schlotz, a grandchild. Esther, a legacy of fun and kindness. Herbie Moore. Dana B. Brian, my dad. It says love. My dog, Coco. Michael Derickery. My husband, Dave. Nellie Carlson, grandma. I think that says Elaine Turek. Turek. Rita Stichen. Steichen. Steichen. Mother, mother in law, grandma, great grandma. Matriarch till 99 years of life. Darwin Miller. The dogs were so snuggly. Larry E. Otis. Joe Ann Coughlin. Coughlin. And then we have some leaves from online, and um, maybe we can give some leaves for them to hang for those. We have um, Michael Homan. Car Sorry. <laughs> Carl and Alice Erickson. Brad, Kevin, Sophie. My big dog, Fen. My father, Jerry. And Carl Strode. And we hang our final leaves for those names that remain unsaid and in our hearts. Thank you to everyone who has helped us hang the leaves.
Thank you to all of our helpers. I know it takes a lot of hands to honor those that, beloved dead and those that have gone before us. In honor of that uh, farewell and to give our love to those that have gone that uh, were difficult to say goodbye to, I'd like to share um, a song, uh, Vem Con Segla, and that is a Scandinavian song in, in various different uh, languages throughout Scandinavia. I'll be singing in uh, my, the best Norwegian I can. <laughs> and uh, sharing that with everyone in uh, the original Norwegian uh, that I learned from my teacher, Kari Toring, and then uh, the English later. Vem kan segla for uten vind? Vem kan rå uten årar? Vem kan reise fra skjæres din sinn? Uten av fella tårar? Jeg kan segla for uten vind, og jeg kan rå uten årer. Med meg reise fra skjæresten min, uten å følge tårer. Who can sail without the wind? Who can row without oars? And who can part from their dearest friends without shedding tears? I can sail without the wind, I can row without oars, but I can't part from my dearest friends without shedding tears. So I now want to share something that I have reflected on for a while. You know, sometimes we talk about honoring our ancestors or um, our ancestor work and spiritually trying to connect with um, those that came before us in not only um, an everyday way but in a spiritual way. And we might think of uh, looking way, way, way back in our family tree and trying to find some fascinating or extraordinary person to connect to. And I know that was the case for me growing up when you had one of those family tree projects. Anybody remember those in school? You're like, all right, who's your immediate family? And then go look way back. And that was what everyone felt so excited about, was like find out about these fascinating ancestors. And I only really briefly outlined the living or known relatives that I had and then just look back at, you know, some fascinating person way, way back. But went on and on about that person from hundreds of years ago that I've never met. But for many folks who have done even a little bit of geolo uh, genealogy or family history work, it's often those small and everyday stories that end up being the most meaningful. And those are the stories that connect us 
most deeply because they look like our own everyday experiences. So in this spiritual practice and uh, practical journey to get to know my beloved past family members, uh, my mom and I planned a trip. And normally, uh, my mom and dad go up north to, you know, upper northeast, you know, Wisconsin uh, to upper Michigan uh, to see si her side of the family because that's where she's from. And they usually go once a year. Now, I hadn't joined them for oh, probably a good 10 years or more, um, just, you know, after college and getting, you know, into the working field and everything. Um, I didn't feel like I had time, but I also didn't make time for it. I'll be completely honest there. And it's always easy to make those excuses of like, oh, I got too many classes or I have to work or, you know, those kind of things to get off for the, the holidays. I usually wanted to go up there. But this time my dad uh, wasn't able to, to join my mom and she asked me, well, do you want to come up with me? And like I said, it's been over a decade. And I'm like, you know, yes, I do. So for me, as part of my own spiritual path, it was leading me to try to connect with my ancestors in a more real way for me. So I agreed to join her, you know, uh, to talk to the family members, go up there, hear some stories, you know, and, and just be there with the folks that are still living uh, in the family. So we were heading up there on one Memorial Day weekend, and um, we decided it would be a good idea to bring flowers for the graves of some of the family members that um, were uh, nearby where we were visiting family. And a friend of mine had recently, just that summer, uh, or I should say that spring, had um, showed me uh, about how um, she had gone uh, headstone searching for one of her family members locally around here. And uh, she showed me how she cleaned the graves. And I thought, oh, that's a really great idea. And I felt like it was a really nice way to try to just respect my ancestors. You know, besides just you know, putting flowers there, I wanted to take time to clean their grave. So I was so inspired by that, you know, I, I told my mom about it and she said, yeah, I think that's a great idea. And, you know, I want, we wanted to go up and do that. So I went to the dollar store and I got a stiff bristle brush and a small little, you know, spray bottle for water. Um, that way it kind of breaks, uh, loosens up the lichens and things. And uh, one of those little like razor blade holder things, I don't know how else to call it, um, to remove lichen and, you know, other um, moss or anything else that might be on the, the graves. So, okay, tools in hand, headed to the cemetery. And this cemetery, you know, I'm used to like ones in town that are big on a hill and sprawling and gates. We literally drove by it. <laughs> We're like, there was! Uh, <laughs> it's just tucked in the woods, this tiny little, um, you know, nestled uh, um, cemetery so we, we almost missed it it's in the middle of this long country road forest all everywhere and then cemetery so it's uh interesting in that so all right we get into this nestled little uh cemetery and you could barely you know could barely find it you almost we almost missed it so now i was expecting this would just be a pretty casual experience i'm like all right i'm gonna go find the gravestone clean it head to the next one very kind of mechanical almost and i went up to the first grave and it was, you know, upright, still pretty easy to read. And I just brushed it clear of, you know, dust and any dirt that was in any of the, you know, words and crevices and designs. And I took my spray bottle and started spraying at the lichen and, um, you know, loosening up those, those pieces. And then had to painstakingly take out oh, my blade, kind of scrape away things. Didn't harm the stone at all, which was nice. And then tried to brush away any areas that were, where there was like an in some of the engravings. And it took a lot more time than I think I expected, but in that time, it, it might sound very menial from the outside, but it was surprisingly because of that amount of time and care that it actually took to do a good job, it felt very intimate. If any of you have ever physically cared for another person, whether maybe they're uh, a young child or uh, an elder or uh, individual different um, physical abilities, I've worked in adult family homes, I've done hospice even for um, family members, and it just, you know, it just feels full of dignity and respect and dare I say sacredness when you are charged with the responsibility of taking time to lovingly care for another person's body that they aren't able to do themselves. It's an immense responsibility that you, you can't forget every moment that you are interacting with them and kind of pouring 
your care for this, not only this person's physical well-being, but their personhood. And that's how I felt with this gravestone. And so I, as I'm cleaning this gravestone and the next to, to I had that feeling of that sacred duty uh, just kind of wash over me uh, very unexpectedly and just filled my heart in a way that I hadn't felt in a long time. And from the outside, it just looks like I'm cleaning graves, but I'm having a moment here. <laughs> and it wasn't just that physical act of cleaning, but of cleansing, purifying, making healthy and new and whole my connection to these relatives, some of whom I'd never seen. So now I, I was working on these graves, and my mom noticed that my great-great-grandmother, um, who we had been looking for, her grave, wasn't with the rest of the family graves. And we thought that was odd. Um, and she had passed away before her husband, who then got remarried, so his you know, last wife was buried with the rest of the family, but his first wife wasn't. So we're really confused by this, and I know different things can happen, but um, you know, we, we knew that she was there because we had looked on the, thankfully this um, cemetery had a website that had listed all the people that were buried there. So we're like, we know she's here, but where? <laughs> That's the hard part. So, um, you know, we went all day searching. And it's not a big cemetery, but there's a lot of stones in the cemetery. And, you know, it was, of course, you know, it's Memorial Day. It was actually getting hot <laughs> and, like, it's just getting sweaty. And then, of course, we're in the woods, so the bugs are like, hi. <laughs> and, you know, all in your, your, by your face trying to bite you. And we just, we couldn't find it. Um, so, sadly, we, we left kind of defeated. Um, because we both wanted to find uh, her gravestone because I'd heard stories about her. And my, my mom said, you, you would have, you, she would have loved you and spoiled you to death and like, you just you like her. And I really wanted to find her um, stone. So, you know, after leaving the cemetery, the, the rest of the day was filled with, you know, visiting our living family members um, on her side of the family. And, you know, that night, I must have had a dream, I don't remember it, but all I remember is waking up feeling slash thinking, I don't know if you ever have that, where you're like, it's both a thought, but also just a feeling that I needed to go back and look one more time. Sorry, so I told my mom that, and she's like, okay, we'll go one more shot. So we went back to the little wooded cemetery, and you know, now this time, I went back with a little more research, because I found deep in the website there was a map it's like, yes. Uh, so I did a little bit of, you know, searching. Like, okay, I got a general area. Um, so I'm going to search and search around. And like, okay, there's Bob Joe. Should be somewhere between here and Billy Bob. And, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, and even, like I said, for being a relatively small um, cemetery, there's a lot of gravestones. And, you know, we're looking at the map. And I'm standing here and I'm saying, okay, in a kind of open-ish area, there weren't any raised, you know, headstones. I'm like, okay, should, you know, I'm thinking to myself, it should be around here somewhere. And I take a step or two, and my foot touches something flat, unless you're thinking like a rock. And I look down, and it's a small stone, but yay big. And it's uh, my great grandmother's stone, but you can only see uh, about like a third of it <laughs> because there was, it was almost completely overgrown. And so I quickly got to work, got my tools out, and I wasn't just brushing away debris, I'm cutting away sod <laughs> to like uncover her, uh, her gravestone. And a good couple of inches of sod, you know, all around. Um, and then, you know, scrubbing and trying to, you know, get, because there's a lot of lichen, it's very, very, uh, like, if we hadn't been there, it probably wouldn't have been found uh, forever, <laughs> honestly. So, Again, this, this familiar feeling of that sacredness came on me, and, and, but this felt more urgent because I, I was trying to f like almost give somebody first aid um, that wasn't breathing. Like I needed to literally resurrect the stone. And it easily could have been lost, like I said, for, for a few more years of no one coming to care for it. Um, so in this physical act of uncovering the grain stove, it just hit me that this is much like our work with our ancestors, that they're there, but without work to tend to those connections, they can become lost or hidden or even nearly impossible to find again if we don't 
routinely care for those connections and remember them and take that time to care for them. And as I thought that, you know, I stood up and I looked down and, you know, of the are now clean and re more easily readable gravestone. And then my eyes caught three more similar stones ahead of her. And that was my great grandmother's parents and sibling that we didn't know were there. And just smiling to myself um, as this work physically and spiritually is never done. Um, I set to work on those three more gravestones, uncovering them, and the ancestors will show up when we take the time and care to seek them. In the spirit of the fact that the children have been so patient and that there's a party downstairs after service, we're going to move into the candy communion. And um, I'm going to get the greeter's help. And so the trick is, though, when we pass this candy out, you're going to have to use all your self-control and not open it. And if you're, only if you're allowed to have the candy from your parent or your guardian, and if you're not allergic. So we tried to pick the least allergic type candy there is. Have you ever wondered why we trick-or-treat on Halloween? Let me tell you. In the past, and still today, people on this day of the year remembered their loved ones who had died by bringing food to them in the cemetery. They also brought lots of sweet food, including candies, to make their ancestors happy. But the loved ones who'd passed on could only enjoy the smell of the food. It was believed that they were pleased, it was believed that if they were pleased, they would look out for their loved ones who were still alive. If they were not, they would play tricks on them throughout the year. So today we celebrate a candy communion to remember our loved ones who are gone and to make our own tummies happy. <laughs> Please wait for my signal before you begin eating. We will, let the, we will open up our packages, let the smell rise up, and then we'll eat it all together, sending out from our hearts our gratitude for those who love us, although they are no longer with us. Okay, is everybody ready? Let's open it up. Make sure everybody has candy first. Now don't eat it, don't eat it. <laughs> you smell the candy? Mm. <laughs> okay, are we ready? Your mark, get set, go. <laughs> Let's enjoy our candy and enjoy our memories.
now um, we'll do our closing hymn, Woyaya, number 1020. And Sue Beadle Sism is going to be our leader. If you'll please rise in body or spirit. And it's number 1020 in our tail hymnal. Join with me in reading the words printed in your bulletin for extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Well, thank you to everyone who's been here for this magical Sunday. It's so great to be here and to celebrate holidays and rituals with our children and all ages. It's great to see people I haven't seen in a while. And, and if you, I'm going to close the service, th these words by Eric Williams. Blessed is the path on which you travel. Blessed is the body which carries you upon it. Blessed is your heart that heard the call. Blessed is your mind that discerns the way. Blessed is the gift that you will receive by going. Truly blessed with this gift that you will become on your journey. May you go forth in peace. May you go in peace and love. And I hope you'll join the children downstairs. We're going to have coffee, a conversation, a Halloween party. In the back is... Uh, Harvest auction donations and questions if you want to buy tickets. Go in peace and go in love.